Okay, so uh, I think we should uh, get started with uh, uh, the last part of uh, my lecture today, uh, which is uh, also a very important part because uh, this is, uh, I think, the first time where we actually uh, get uh, deep into uh, the notion of getting funding and uh, where to get it. So um, we'll proceed with that now. Um, to sort of start up, uh, it's very important to, uh, to realize why it is you need funding. Uh, and that's because essentially there's a difference between a, a normal, mature company and a startup. In a, in, a, in a normal company, let's say a healthy company, if you will, um, you have this cycle of, you know, you do the R&D, you produce the products, you sell, you know, you have other costs like sales costs and administrative costs, administration costs, sorry. And then you sell the product and that, you know, selling the product gives you money enough to, you know, go into that cycle again, maybe even with a profit. Um, the situation is a little bit different with a startup. The problem is that you actually don't know that you'll be able to sell. Uh, and you don't exactly know how much it's going to cost to produce. And you don't exactly know what these other costs and maybe even what the R&D is, is, is going to cost you. So uh, you need someone. And, and obviously, because you don't have uh, an idea of these things, there's a lot of risk involved. And what do you do then? Well, obviously, you need to get some funding. Uh, and that's where the investors come in. So the investor essentially has the role of uh, forcing this cycle maybe through a number of iterations so that you actually get to this stage where you have a healthy uh, company that actually runs on its own well uh, sales and its own uh, funds uh, so that's what I'll be uh, will be uh, telling you about now um, and again I think I've mentioned this uh, at earlier stages but this is the crucial part the selling so all of your R&D, all of your market research, all of your segmentations, uh, you know, all that stuff has the purpose of uh, ensuring that you're actually able to sell your product when you get to that phase. So this is essentially what the, in the investor will always be looking at. Will this company be able to sell something and actually will it be able to sell a lot? So this is an overview. Again, uh, this is a... A graphic I did that uh, isn't really something that you can, uh, you know, grasp uh, within the time you have here. But uh, what I would just uh, encourage you to do is get back to this to get an overview of uh, if you have like this, the, the life cycle. I wouldn't say to call it a cycle at this stage, but at least the life of uh, an entrepreneurial, you know, startup. Uh, you start off with the idea. You have what's called the pre-seed phase. Uh, to sort of keep it biological and then you have the actual seed where you start it out you don't have any profits but you need to you know get it going then you have the actual startup at this stage you have a, an idea of there is a market uh, maybe you even have interest from the first companies maybe you even have some first letters of intent or some some customers actually signing on for for wanting to buy the product and then from there you go into these first, second, and third round investments, which are about you know accelerating, going into new segments, going to the U.S., going to Japan, going to you know wherever, but you don't have the money for it, so you need investments. And then finally, when it all gets uh, nice and tidy, and you have a presence uh, uh, across the globe, you go to yeah maybe even a public offering. Actually, you you register your um, your company as a you know. A, uh, a publicly uh, traded uh, stock company, or you can buy your stock on, a, on, on the free market or something like that. But what I do here is actually I just try to uh, map out the different, uh, the different uh, investors that you could consider in different phases. In the very early stages, the, you have these three Fs, as, uh, as uh, Jens Christian also uh, mentioned. They're called the friends, fools, and family, and that's because you know, at that stage, the risk is so high and you know the idea is so vague that the only persons who are actually willing to probably willing to invest in you are well your family or your friends or yourself maybe so so that's what you can expect at that stage but you know lately something new has come out the crowdfunding uh, because if you're able to do a good visualization of your solution you're able to communicate the basis of your idea you don't necessarily have 
uh, data on the market. You don't necessarily have data on exactly how it's going to be solved. Well, you could get crowdfunding. And that's where uh, Kickstarter and websites like Indiegogo and the Danish website Boomerang are, uh, come into play because that makes it really interesting and at an early stage. Of course, there are trade-offs because you, you communicate your idea at a very early stage as well. Um, but then going on, you have the public funds. In Denmark, there are a lot of funds, um, and we'll be looking closer into that at a later stage. And also uh, the so-called innovation environments, which are essentially investors working as well, what you would call venture capitalists. They take a share of your company, and they put, in money, uh, put money into your company. But they do it on very good terms, and they are very risk-willing, so they're able to actually go in at an early stage. And moving on, we have the business angels. That's you know, another term for a person who has enough money to invest. And usually these, these guys are you know, willing to invest in something that's a really good idea because they you know, tend to invest with, as, you say, as we would say, the heart and not necessarily the brain. In real life, they do both, but, uh, but that's at least uh, a generalization. And then you go on to uh, private corporate investors and venture capitalists. I'll be explaining this this further. Venture capitalists, uh, you know, we all know, we've probably heard the term, they're the ones who, you know, uh, see the potential for the idea, they see that the, the market has been confirmed and now they just need a heck of a lot of money for it to just grow and we get a hockey stick. So that's where they come into play. Yep. Sorry? You have the red bar investor Ah, this is, I, I have to stress that this is just off the top of my head. So this is my immediate you know, uh, uh, description of how, what, what the different phases look like and what overall amounts you can expect to, uh, to get from these different types of investors. Because that's the next point. When you're at this early stage, you could get at the most 5 million kroner. If you're, you can in, you know, uh, in the one percentile uh, you know, cases, you can, can maybe get more, but uh, you know, most of the investments are within this bracket. And going on with, as you say, venture capitalists, well, they would be able to provide something like between these three and 20 million dollars. Uh, sorry, million kroner. These, are, these uh, numbers are in kroner. And you don't have to look too much into this, but this is just essentially uh, a, you know, a list for you to remember what these different investors will be looking at in your company at different stages. So this provides an overview for you. Um, well, moving on to uh, describing the different phases themselves, uh, themselves um, the pre-seed, seed phase. Well, that's a phase where you pretty much haven't shown anything. You're not going to make any money. You're not going to, you know, there's a lot of risk involved. You know, we probably have two or three or four different, uh, very, very important factors that can essentially, you know, make it or break, make or break your company. Um, but uh, fortunately, we do have funding sources in that, uh, in that, uh, in that phase. We have, of course, uh, the friends, the fools, and the families uh, who are willing to go broke to help your stupid product, project. Uh, we have the crowdfunding who are willing to do pretty much the same. Uh, the business angels, uh, they're a bit more advanced. You have to have some info on what the, your idea actually uh, has as a potential and what the market is. And the public funds and innovation environments are, you know, even more uh, advanced. I'll get back to the public funds as that are a very important part of this, uh, this funding, these funding strategies. And as I mentioned earlier, at this stage, the idea has uh, huge value because, um, you know, let's face it, you don't have the data. So uh, do you have something that can, you know, open doors? Something that easily communicates and something that you know a lot of people will you know hear and say okay that that sounds that sounds fair that's you know pretty much what they'll be buying into at this stage um, they uh, of course uh, in return for that they you know they they do uh, take a high risk and of course taking a high risk they also expect a high return on it as I'll get back to uh, later an, in an investor at this stage will probably expect a tenfold return on the investment within a you know a time of maybe five years. So that's that's pretty much what uh, what you can expect, and that's why you need the hockey stake essentially. Uh, and also, as I said earlier, the team is key. Uh, one thing is that one thing could be that the uh, that the idea isn't that well described. Another thing is that 
you can actually see that you have a team that seems to be you know, able to bring something like this forward. So that's, that's very important in this stage. Um, <clears throat> so as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you'll probably have a few critical points that can essentially, in this stage, kill uh, your, your idea. It could be something like, does the prototype work? And, you know, if it works or if it's you know, suboptimal, that can be a huge problem to you. Uh, and every time you have these factors, you have to address them, of course, in relation to how, you know, how important they are and how important they are to the value of the company. And uh, you have to you know, prioritize them. Um, <clears throat> and of course, each time you validate something like this, you reduce the risk of the investment. And that, you know, over time, qualifies you for other types of investors who have a different uh, risk profile than these early stage investors. And it tends to look something like this. Um, every time you sort of get uh, to one of these points where you get, for instance, some, some good market insights, we figure out that we should start in this market. The risk drops and the value of the company rises. Uh, then maybe you find out that the prototype works. Again, the risk drops and the value of the company rises. And again, it could go the other way. Every, every one of these points could essentially kill the company. And that's why at this stage, uh, you wouldn't expect more than maybe one third of the companies to survive uh, going uh, into maybe, yeah, uh, venture capital, uh, raising venture capital. Yeah, and, and one very important one is if you can actually get some kind of commitment from the customer, that's always the important factor because that means that you can sell this product at some stage, or at least you have a good idea of being able to sell, uh, sell it. So I deliberately, did a quick, a, a, a large risk reduction at that uh, point. And of course, the costs are bound to be very high. And that is to, of course, be seen in relation to the fact that you don't have any earnings. So you're just a big black hole that uh, the investors throw the money into. And hopefully at some stage, you know, the, the hole will be filled and you'll start making money. Um, and again, just to re reiterate on that, uh, the investor, the typical investor, and I'm not talking the friends, fools, and family, will probably be you know, willing to put down between half a million kroner and five million kroner at this stage. Um, but I would definitely consider getting the wheels rolling using some, uh, some crowdfunding or maybe the friends, fools, and family. So going on to the startup phase, um, well, now at this stage, we actually have an idea. We maybe have this uh, first contract from a customer saying that, you know, provided that this product, uh, you know, meets the requirements that you're sketching out and you have that in the contract, we would be willing to buy it uh, for this and this price. So that, that's a very important thing. And, and also uh, that you have uh, uh, some info on the market and that the technology seems to be working and seems to be in order. Still, there's a lot of risk involved, you know, probably from uh, different, uh, different factors that you haven't thought of at this stage or some, something that comes pretty much out of the blue. Um, you, but you will be looking at different uh, investors because the risk has, you know, been reduced. And you will probably talk to some private investors. A private investor is, you know, someone, maybe a, a company. It could be like a wind turbine company, in my case, that has an investment branch. And the reason why they differ from other investors is because they usually invest in stuff that has a relation to their own business. So a private investor is interesting because, for instance, if you have a, let's say, a machine shop that invests, they can see that they can actually produce this thing, this product, uh, very cheaply, and they can, you know, get some business out of it for their machine shop, their existing business. So they have, you know, more favorable criteria for investing into something. And then you have the venture capitalists. Uh, there are a lot of them in Denmark. There are a lot of them in, in Silicon Valley. In Denmark, you could uh, mention someone like Vextfonden, uh, who was also mentioned by Jens Christian Fuhl. Um, and, uh, and well, actually, Vextfonden is even more risk willing than a typical venture capitalist. But uh, they're the ones who expect a high return, but they're also willing to take a high risk. And they're very professional. They're, they're the ones who need the, the actual business plan written you know, in, in full that you have all the, the factors covered and you have as many you know, risk uh, factors identified as possible and you have a, a credible idea for how to solve that. Um, essentially, what they're looking at is cases where you can see that the customers are just waiting for this. They need a lot of, the company needs a lot of money to get there, but the customers are out there. It's been validated. They're waiting. 
So that's when they go into a company. Uh, and again, in this, in this stage, the team is important. It, it is in all stages. But in this stage, you could would often see that the investor would require you to maybe get one of uh, the staff of the investor online in the board or maybe even working in the daily operation of the company. So you would have requirements from the investor to you. Um, just to do the same uh, sketch as before, um, in the case of the venture phase or the startup phase as we call it, it's, uh, you have a, a slightly different characteristic and one of the very important things that has changed is the fact that you will probably be starting to earn money. And uh, of course a company is, uh, is never moving towards a sustainable cycle if it's not moving money. So that's where the value of the company really just skyrockets. And uh, things like uh, pilot customer signings, hopefully you did that in the seed phase. Uh, but uh, that's a very important uh, thing for, for value creation. And you'll probably have some large production costs because this is where you're setting up the production for delivering your first uh, products or you're setting up production or you're buying products out in the world or getting the, you know, the electronics working and some development costs as well. Um, and then you get to a point where you actually have your first real sales. This is in the first segment of the first market. So this might be, you know, selling only to uh, mining companies in Argentina or something like that. But this is where you have your first sales and you start making money. People are actually buying this. And you start getting a proof of, you know, can we produce it at the right price and uh, can we sell it at a, you know, higher price. So you actually start showing that your company has a value. Um, and moving on at some point, you actually get to a point where you have your earnings uh, supersede your costs. And that's you know, the point we would call break even, or <laughs> we, we discussed that yesterday, what exactly to call that point. But at least when your earnings uh, you know, are more than your, your costs, that's when you're actually, you know, for the first time, a real company that earns money and you don't necessarily need an investor. So, of course, that has to, you know, uh, reflect itself in an, a, a very big increase in the value of the company. And at this stage, you could probably expect somewhere between 20 and, uh, sorry, 3 and 20 million uh, kroner from the investors. Uh, okay, so just to, uh, just to uh, get your brains working a little bit and just uh, listening, Actually, I think I'd like to get your help for, uh, for handling my own little situation with my own company. Uh, as you know, I have this wind turbine that's, uh, you know, I'm trying to launch and I'm trying to get money for it. Uh, but there's a problem though, and I'll be introducing the Edgefield Catch-22 to you now. Um, because the thing is that I have a technology that works. I know that the customers are interested and uh, we have a, you know, good idea of how to get it into the market and actually getting it launched. The thing is just that we need money. And uh, when I talk to the investors, they're very interested. They're saying, okay, this is, this is something we could invest into, but mm, we'd, like, uh, we'd like a bit more commitment from uh, the customers. We'd like a bit more, you know, a few more letters of intent. We'd like, uh, you know, maybe even customers signing onto it or something, you know, a turbine uh, working at a, at a customer side. But moving on, when we talk to the customers, and obviously we're doing that all the time, uh, the customers are saying, well, this is really interesting, but you know, before we can put it up on our IKEA warehouse or whatever, we need, well, a few more hours of operation. And the thing is just that up until now, we've developed a product that was you know, essentially a prototype because we didn't have money for you know, doing the full-blown development. And so what we're saying is, well, <laughs> to get there, to actually have a product that, you know, works and, well, it does work, but that can last, that can be in operation for long periods and, you know, maybe even on a building, we need a lot of money. So that's where it all, you know, comes uh, to a halt because uh, we need money for, well, essentially initiating this. So uh, my question to you is... Um, how the heck do I how do I, how the heck do I handle this? Um, so I'd like you to spend five minutes in each group uh, discussing this. And if you need any more info from me, you're welcome to just put your hand up, and I'll try to uh, provide some uh, the insights, the few insights that I do have, 
Um, and uh, then afterwards, I'd love to hear your conclusions and maybe I can, you know, get the ball rolling. So thanks for that in advance. Cool. So what am I doing wrong? <laughs> can anyone offer an insight? Otherwise, yep. So maybe taking um, small steps instead of uh, getting the full support from customers, maybe you could offer some in return, like um, better deals when the product is uh, finished. Mm -hmm. um, of course, uh, investors would uh, look at this as well and say, well, you offered some back. Um, but it would be a small step on the way and you would get some money to further develop the product and maybe mm -hmm. next time you could take a, a bigger step. Yeah. Uh, good we also discussed the change of focus from like targeting the big, the big shops and the big, uh, the big customers, and you should target smaller customers. Like instead of a 15 meter version, you should do a two meter version to put on people's um, private homes or something. Uh, that would be cheaper. That would be cheaper, but the problem is that it, well, that's a that's a valid point. Changing our focus and and, and looking at it to other places. But there are a lot of problems with regards to the basic business of, of the, the wind turbine itself that relates to that. There's simply not a, re, not a resource uh, in the spots where people tend to settle down. So, uh, but thanks for that. How much would an edge flow cost? The wind turbine, the, a 12 meter unit would probably cost somewhere around, in, in the early stages, 180,000 kroner, maybe 200,000, depending on which market we're in. Yeah. Uh, so the odd idea that you could go to a daily broadcast media or something like that, team up with them, and then maybe some green innovation uh, competition thing, and then say, okay, uh, if we can get a customer, they will get some commercial value that they have a green approach. And, uh, say they, they can support this and try to implement it in one of their buildings, and then get a story out of it. Mm -hmm. Then they will earn their their money in trying to be have a green approach. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's, a, that's a good idea, leveraging you know, media and seeing how we can you know, get a, a bus going there. The problem is, I think, in, that, in relation to that, is that we don't have a turbine that we feel that we can put up on a building. So that's, that's where the problem is uh, in relation to that. Um, yep? Uh, as I understand it, you are going much for the, the industry and there are large buildings. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have been talking about is maybe going for someone uh, for whom the green profile is more important. Uh, and we are talking about uh, the, the hotels because the hotels are in direct uh, contact with their customers mm -hmm. and I think a green uh, profile for them would be very valuable. So mm -hmm. maybe one of the hotel chains uh, could go into the project uh, and, and help you do the testing and do the investment. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been working much on a crowdfunding campaign? Putting up the video? Or no, not at all. It seems like the type of thing that you do really cool uh, video. And stuff. Sure, definitely, and we have the videos of the turbine itself and things like that, so yeah. And I think I'm not completely sure whether or not that's possible. I, I think my main concern would be, but I think it's a good input, uh, but I think my concern would be, uh, you know, the cost of the product, because it is, you know, 150, 200,000 kroner, and, you know, the crowdfunding projects are usually, you know, at the most, maybe 10,000 kroner. But I don't know if that, maybe that's it's possible. It's, it's not only the money, it's the marketing as well. You're yeah. the idea and then you should sure. probably interest just from the videos we put up. And it's yeah. quite cheaper the way of... Yeah, that's a, good, that's a very good point. And we're at a stage, at an earlier stage, we're very, you know, adamant about not, uh, you know, being too visible out there because we were working on uh, patents and things like that. But at this stage, we're at a stage where we just want to expose ourselves. So, yeah, and that's, that also relates to your comment regarding uh, media up there. Also in relation to the, the exposure, uh, some of the companies, I think they moved it out, they have some quite evolution in the wind wheels uh, close to the uh, highway. Mm -hmm. so they were not uh, efficient enough, but uh, thinking about contacting specifically the companies close to the highway, because they have large billboards with their names, and if they have one of your turbines at the top, mm -hmm. that would be uh, good. That's a good point. Thanks for that. Up there, uh, at the side. Of, uh, selling, about selling the prototype with some uh, 
altered uh, specification and say, okay, you can have this one for reduced price or uh, full time support and, and stuff like that to say, okay, get it up there, get it running, and get a get some con uh, yeah, get a contract from the customer saying we want this and mm -hmm. then yeah. the final one is out then some sort of uh, switch. Yeah. Yeah, definitely that could be done, you know, it's, it, it, lowering the bar, <laughs> saying that it's not going to work for a long time. It's not, you know, maybe it's going to run for a while, then, but it's going to cost less. Cool. Is that in the back? Yeah, you're definitely right. That's, I suppose that's more of a segmentation, you know, uh, approach and a business model approach than, you know, because uh, we would still have to sell it to Dong, you know, and they'd probably be requesting some of the same stuff that, okay, we'd see, we'd like to see some more, you know, uh, hours of operation in the turbine and things like that. Yeah, but there would be more into power generation, mm -hmm. more, that would be their business. And they would have bigger pockets. Yeah, they have yeah. bigger pockets. Yeah. And the other thing we were thinking about is, Generally, I don't believe that companies want to mess with this. So instead, you should make like a concept where where you do it all like a financial package. If you sign this finance package, we just send you three thousand or three hundred thousand for a year. Because why should any company run the risk of one of those devices breaking down, needing mm -hmm. to set up? Then they need to set up a windmill organization. Yeah, hey, that's a good point. Why would IBM set up a windmill? Yeah. We're much better at managing a turbine and a building not uh, than, than the customer is, so yeah, definitely so right. it should be like a package deal where mm. if you sign this deal, we send you service out for over a year, you don't have to care. Yeah. That's, that's a very valid point and it's something we're looking into. And also the, pro the problem in that relation is to, you know, handle the liquidity because you don't get money on, off of sale. Maybe you get money off selling, selling uh, electricity and something like that. So you still have to pay for the production costs and how do you manage that? So, last uh, comment? Um, I'm mainly targeting private investors or...? Uh, yeah, actually at this stage we're targeting private investors, yeah. Maybe public yeah. funding um, from the government or business angels or something would, would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, Mercur, um, bank, the bank, mm -hmm. um, gives really cheap loans to green companies. Yeah. Um, so that, that could be another uh, option. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot for the input in general. It's, uh, some, you have some really good ideas and I can tell you that they definitely correspond a heck of a lot to, uh, to also what we're considering in the board and in the company. And there's some new dimensions there as well with the, the media and also the bank financing and, uh, and some business model ideas as well. So thanks a lot for that. But uh, let's go on to uh, the last phase, the so-called growth phase. At this stage, you know, you've, you've shown that your, your idea works, your company actually works, you have the earnings and you have you know, a lower cost of the product and essentially what you want to do is go into new segments. But going into a new segment costs money and you may be earning money but you may not be earning enough money to go into a new segment. And where do you go to then? Well, again actually you could talk to the private investors and the venture capital, capitalists but this is also the stage where you start talking to the banks who at the earlier stages would perceive your venture as too much of a risk. Uh, so if banks are more interested in financing, well in general, I don't know about my core cool bank, bank, but in general they're more interested in financing the operation of a company and not you know, the startup of a company. Uh, so the, you could definitely contact those. And also you have in Denmark, for instance, and in many other countries, the pension funds that would be interested in, in an investment like this. Um, they're not looking to get as high a yield as the early investors. Obviously, there has to be a, you know, a benefit, for, you know, a, 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 a reason for going in at an earlier level. But at the same time, they don't accept uh, as high a risk. And that's why 
you they invest at a time you've already shown that your company works in another segment. Um, so uh, at this stage, the role of uh, the entrepreneur actually also try, starts ebbing out because uh, you need to replicate yourself in other companies, in other countries, and in other segments, and you need to just uh, optimize your operations. So you know this whole idea about doing something completely new, you know that's more something they do in the R and D department. And of course, you can always rethink the business models as well. But uh, generally, you see the in inventor or the Entrepreneurs starting to, you know, moving out of the, starting to move out of the company at this stage, and this is also the hockey stick stage. This is where you really see, you know, an aggressive attack on new segments and a corresponding growth in value of the company. So it looks something uh, something like this, where you have uh, the value of the company just pretty much increasing exponentially, and and similarly you have the earnings. You know, increasing, but you have costs each time you go into uh, go into a new segment. You have to uh, you know plan for a lot of costs, and that's where the investors help you. Whoops! And at this stage, you could probably expect well more than uh, an investment of probably more than fifty million kroner. Um, so, just to give an overview of the different uh, investor types, I, again, I don't want to go too much into this. Uh, what I would like to uh, to you know, outline is the fact that you have sort of basically two different types of investors. You have the ones who want a stock of your company and the ones who don't. And you know, banks don't want a stock of your company, but they do want you to pay the money back. Um, crowdfunders don't want a stock of your company, but they do want something back, a service or a product in return. Uh, venture uh, capitalists, they want a stock of your company. That's what we would call an equity shareholder. Um, uh, and from having that stock, that's where they get their money back. Um, but there is one very, and that's interesting that you mentioned that. I think you mentioned it, the, the public fund, in relation to my own uh, situation, because what the feedback I've been given from investors and my market is that I should focus more on the public funds. And uh, the reason for that I'll get into now. Uh, there's a term in uh, you know, investor uh, circles called gearing. An investment, and that essentially means that well, obviously the investor wants to get as much as possible for as little as, as possible, and uh, also the investor is uh, you know often interested in you know mitigating the risk so that he's not the sole carrier of the investment, um, and uh, the problem from your standpoint is the fact that as an investor comes in and puts a heck of a lot of money into your company, well, you have to give a corresponding amount of shares away. away. And suddenly you may end up with a situation where you know, the investor takes a majority in the company and pretty much is able to decide most things. Um, and in that relation, public funding comes in because public funding uh, is essentially given uh, to companies from, well, obviously the public. And they don't request anything else than you using the money in a, you know, a good way and a proper way. And you also will probably be uh, required to, uh, to report on your progress. But that's pretty much it. So what you can do is go to the funds, the EUDPs, the renewal funds, and places like that, and get money for gearing. So that the investor maybe puts down six million, but he gets development and you know, business development and uh, technology for development for, for 10 million, because he you know, has the gearing from the public funding. And that's the reason why, and it has, kind of has to be like that because the public funding always requires there to be a, you know, a co-financing of some magnitude, typically between 40 and 60%. And what I'd like you to do now is actually go on to this website called innovationsradar.com. I think most of you have a laptop on the tables. And for your idea, I'd like you to um, search uh, use the website to see if you can find some relevant funds for your particular project. Because uh, that would, if you can uh, apply for those funds, you would be able to get some gearing on your investment if uh, you got to that point. So uh, did I not write anything? Let's say this is uh, five minutes. I think I wrote that up there. Let's spend five minutes doing this and just uh, we'll follow up on that afterwards. Cool. Thanks a lot. 
So I think uh, I, I'm sure you can uh, continue with this uh, exercise afterwards. Uh, the idea of uh, getting gearing for your projects is, uh, is always interesting. And I think this is something that you could mention in your business plan that you actually have these funds that you're going to uh, apply for. So just to uh, very quickly, I, th I think we uh, have to proceed uh, you know, rather fast here. But uh, could you just get uh, maybe a, a few inputs on uh, what you found? Did any of the groups uh, find anything interesting back there? Big fun. Big fun, yeah. And big fun is actually <laughs> that's that's a bit of a that's a bit of a hassle because this this also lists investors equity investors, and Vex Fund would be taking an equity share of your 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 your, your, uh, your company. So in this relation, actually, Vex Fund is not a, a public fund as such, but that it's it's the only <laughs> fund that uh, falls out of the category, unfortunately. So uh, I'm, I should have uh, specified that. Uh, before starting the exercise, so but because that's not going to work as gearing. Now, any other inputs? Yep. Uh, I have Dania. Yeah. It's a yeah, foundation which focuses on health and also handicapped uh, people. So. Cool. Great. So I think we'll be proceeding now. But remember this website. Remember your search terms. Remember what you came up with because this is something that you can use in your business plan. Something that could be relevant. Yeah. That sounds absolutely brilliant. If, could I get you to share a link or maybe a short description on uh, on CampusNet or something so that the so that all the groups can uh, can get some insights around that? That sounds really brilliant. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. Um, just a few uh, additional notes. I mentioned this earlier. You know, most investors these days tend to be what you would call a knowledge investor. So they don't necessarily they don't only invest money, they also invest know-how, and often that know-how relates to, well, business development, all the stuff that the inventors aren't necessarily all that good at. And um, also, you might be afraid of an investor taking the majority of your company, but in most cases, they're actually not interested in that because them having the majority also means that it, they're expected to bail the company out if something goes wrong. So in most cases, they'll be asking for less than the majority of the company. And uh, just a quick note on uh, why crowdfunding is a really good idea. I, I mentioned earlier in this presentation that you know the investors are looking at your ability to sell, uh, sell, and you know selling is pretty much everything. The cool thing about crowdfunding and websites like Kickstarter is that um, you get the wheels rolling and you validate the market. So essentially, you get the investment and you validate that there's a need out there. So that's why crowdfunding is a really good idea in relation to all the things that we've been, uh, I've been describing here. Um, and um, right after the break, uh, we'll have uh, the last guest lecture. Uh, I haven't uh, given him all the time that I promised him, but uh, I hope it's okay that we run a little bit over time because I think that you'll all be very interested in hearing what Christian Lund has to uh, tell you about uh, an organization called Vextus Greater Copenhagen, which is one of the you know, must 
uh, must, uh, what do you call it, one of the, the organizations you simply must know about. So um, we'll have a short, let's say, five-minute break, and then after that, Christian will uh, be uh, presenting.